Today, when conflict is urban, there is an enormous amount of and very different type of evidence that we have access to. Some of them are language, testimonies of people. Uh, we can speak to people, they can upload material uh, online. Others are a little bit less traditional, but I think we know now that um, the, you know, or we feel the enormous amount of images and data that conflict, especially conflict happening in cities, uh, produce. Uh, this require, this enable us to create accountability uh, when we are not uh, able to actually reach the ground. But the problem of open source investigation is collecting that material, verifying it, seeing that those videos are genuine, and that they are from the area where we think we are, uh, and then synchronizing them in a way that can tell a story. So what you see here behind me is a kind of perhaps um, less than 5% of the images that forensic architecture collected of a single day of war in Gaza uh, in the summer of 2014, the Israeli army invaded Gaza, August 1st uh, was the one day of this uh, war uh, where most uh, civilian casualties uh, were sustained. And Amnesty International, the organization that actually commissioned us to do it, uh, was unable to enter. The Israeli government uh, banned uh, the entry into Gaza. So we started collecting and receiving material from many people on the ground. Um, but sometimes the amount of material does not equal clarity. Uh, in some images we see tanks firing, in others we see buildings getting hit by shell, we see civilians running, we see bomb clouds, etc. How to compose and to create a narrative uh, from all these, uh, the wealth of this material? The biggest problem is that of metadata. When you collect material in, from open sources, they come without the metadata, which mainly for our purpose, is the space and time in which those images were taken. So we need to find other ways to do it. We need to find what we call physical clocks within those images that would allow us to understand what time they were taken. One of the techniques in which art historians were always trying to establish the time location on images was meteorology, looking at clouds. And here, adapting that technique, we decided to look at bomb clouds, understanding that each one of them has a unique signature in time and space. Uh, we are able, therefore, to collect clips from different parts of our archive and to synchronize them by seeing the precise development of each cloud. I showed you three, but we are allowed to sync up hundreds of those videos simply by looking at the sky above. But you need an anchor. An anchor could be provided by satellite imagery. There was one satellite imagery of that day of August 1st. Uh, it was taken at 11.39 in the morning. And by chance, it captured a bomb cloud just as it was exploding. We spent days looking for precisely that cloud and found it uh, on the ground uh, here and had to verify precisely its dimension and location. When we were content that this is the one, we were able to time that image and then via triangulation, the rest of the images of the battlefield. So in fact, looking at the development of bomb cloud in the sky allowed us to create a narrative um, and to create a timeline uh, of that day and to start seeing what is happening to civilians uh, on the ground. I mean, you would see how the timeline actually uh, develops, how those synchronizations would happen. This is done manually, uh, but now we have systems and techniques to use machine learning and artificial intelligence to actually accelerate our work that always has uh, a human dimension to it. Then we need to verify where those images are. This is a photograph taken from near a hospital in Rafah, and we see a bomb landing very close to it. We know it is there because we can match the image within our model. The model becomes a way of navigation through the space. Looking at the cloud so closely, we start noticing other things. In fact, we start noticing bombs in mid-fall 
splits of a second before they hit the ground and in this particular occasion killed, according to Amnesty's researchers, 16 uh, civilians. Amnesty lawyers asked us to see if we could actually tell which bomb it is and who is the manufacturer. Uh, we could freeze those in mid-air, uh, build the dimension of the photograph into the model, measure the photograph, put a grid behind them, measure those bombs, split off a second before they come, and find out exactly what ammunition uh, was used, and that enables further legal work or uh, corporate accountability work. So forensic architecture is almost like uh, a pathology of a building. And in a sense, it is a kind of skill that had to emerge. Uh, why buildings? Because wars, most conflicts right now, take place in urban areas. And when they do take place in urban areas, buildings are the targets. And when they are the targets, analyzing buildings, analyzing the rubble, allow us to be something like perhaps archaeologists of the present. And of course, architecture is also the medium that allows us to look, synchronize, and locate the images in space. I personally, maybe you hear from my accent, grew up in Israel and was very much involved in the, around 2000, the year 2000, in activism and uh, human rights work um, concerned with Israeli settlements in the occupied West Bank and Gaza. All those buildings that you see here might look like nice suburbs, but they're actually violation of international treaties and human rights. Uh, in fact, these are kind of architectural crimes happening on the drawing board. And analyzing them and analyzing their relation to Palestinian built fabric uh, became uh, very important in that work. A big part of that research uh, relied on drawing what was at the time uh, the first map of settlements in the occupied territories. These are in blue, marked in blue here on that map. The area in lighter blue are the areas of their expansion. And what you see in lighter brown are the areas left for Palestinian semi-autonomous areas around. You see that the problem is a problem of form, and formal analysis becomes incredibly important here. We were responding at a time to the call of a great Palestinian scholar called Edward Said, who called for counter-cartography. He said, cartography is usually the tool of the dominator. It is the tool of the colonists. It's the tool of the imperial powers in the, since the 17th century onwards. Counter-cartography is a way of inverting that cartographic gaze. Somehow, the development of um, satellite imagery and the social media imagery that I showed you before has Made, uh, made it necessary for us to turn counter-cartography into counter-forensics, use forensic tools really to investigate alleged state crimes and human rights violation. Uh, but sometimes we don't have images, or perhaps uh, only a satellite image. This is the Syrian prison of Saidnaya, uh, run by the Assad government. Uh, it is one of the most notorious uh, detention center when different human rights groups um, a confirmed uh, death in custody, executions, and torture are happening there. And we wanted to reconstruct that prison, but there were no images. No reporting organization was allowed in, and there was no journalism uh, inside. We know that um, memory has a spatial dimension to it. You, we know that we recollect things when we return to places where they have happened. But sometimes you cannot take survivors back to the scene of the crime. It's simply uh, impossible to do. Also, survivors' um, memory is a complicated thing. Survivors are usually traumatized. And trauma does strange things to memory. Sometimes blackouts, repetition. It stretches spaces and time in unpredictable way. Together with forensic psychologists, we have developed uh, an entire methodology of interviewing survivors within 3D uh, environments. Uh, we would build with them 3D models, and the process would evolve through a feedback loop. Um, the model will be built through what they can describe to us, and their memory would be rebuilt by being placed in those um, 
in those spaces. The problem in Sadnaya was that there were that most prisoners were led blindfolded into the prison. They haven't seen it. We had to work with acoustic engineers here with Lawrence Abu Hamdan uh, in order to give our model uh, sound properties, uh, reverberation and echo modeling, and through that we could approximate the spaces, locations, and distances that we later corroborated uh, with the satellite imagery and others. I'm going to show you two short clips and how, how it works when one models architecturally sometimes very mundane things and a traumatic memory uh, might emerge. Here, the Palestinian architect on our team, Hania Jamal, asks the detainee to model the hatch on his solitary confinement room. الشراقه اللي سم... نفس الشيء اللي سميناه طاقه شيء تحت بسموه شراقه بقى على قد عرضه uh, عرضه بيقدر he tells that the the hatch is a bit bigger than his face he relates the size or dimension of his body with architectural ones and uh, and then she asks what has happened and apparently the story that he has not told on normal interviews kind of sprang up where he was in this solitary confinement cell and a guard on the other side wanted to punish him, ask him to push his head through that hatch. فعملت هيك ففعليا انا وقت عملت هيك راسي بالعرض مرق بالعرض بال يعني وقت صار العرض تبع راسي هو الطول الطبيعي وبعد ما طلعته بالعرض رجع جلس لي اياه بحيث صارت جوزت حلقي على زي ال هي هذا الزي تبع الشراقه بسموه and then his head was kicked and stamped upon on the other side. He fainted. And, but, but you could see that that most traumatic memory needed a, a very technical, sometimes architectural question uh, to emerge. Uh, what we exp then we, we placed that online in a kind of an interactive environment uh, where people could actually experience some of those uh, testimonies. We managed to reconstruct the architecture of the prison for sound and and memory, you could navigate through it, go to the cell and listen to a testimony. It was one of the uh, very much viewed uh, human rights report. Um, and it led uh, Assad to be questioned uh, on it. And this is what he had to say. The report that you, mentioned, you have mentioned, it was a report made by Qatar and financed by Qatar. Uh, you don't know the source, you don't know the names of those victims. Nothing verified about that report. It was paid by Qatar directly in order to vilify and smear the Syrian government and the Syrian army. There so are a lot of eyewitnesses. No one knows mm -hmm. who are they. You don't have anything clear about that. It's not verified. So no. If we were indeed offered Qatari money, I don't know, we might have a dilemma, but we were never uh, offered that. And in fact, what is interesting in it is that you see that in human rights work or in counter forensic work, Increasingly, people go um, look for who, who is your funder. We are funded by the ERC, a European Research Council grant. We're funded by human rights and technology grants. Uh, we're funded sometimes by commissions from our client, such as Human Rights Watch or Amnesty. Um, but indeed, um, all those um, donors do not exercise authority over our finds or our methods. Uh, but increasingly, we find that people try to use uh, a certain um, relativism as uh, camouflaged as kind of like healthy skepticism. Uh, in a sense, in the principle of post-truth is precisely that. There's a kind of a new propaganda around now. But unlike the propaganda of old, is not trying to convince us of this ideology versus the other, but trying indeed to create a perceptual blurring by which we would not know anymore uh, what is true and what is not. And therefore, verification becomes an incredibly important and arduous process. Verification is a process that must take place, not only technologically, but must build a diagram and a relation of institutions and experts, 
people on the ground that suffer violence, those that film and record it, those that write about it, the human rights organization that are sent to, to write report about it, university research centers like us that are able to contribute technologically uh, to it, and perhaps the media that could amplify our voice. These are the kind of the network that are absolutely essential for us of maintaining uh, truth at, uh, at this moment in time when truth becomes such a precious commodity. I wanted to show just a, a, a very last um, <coughs> sequence here uh, about American involvement or US involvement rather in um, a, a military base in Cameroon, the Salak military base, where again, um, reports of torture and execution have taken place. The American military said uh, they do not know anything about it. They have no access to those places. And we know that Facebook, Facebook is spying on us, but it also could be a good resource to counter and look um, at uh, violations uh, of others. We build a model in order to match the Facebook photographs of an American service person who simply forgot to switch off his location manager, and we can see exactly where this person was because we can match it within the model. And we can see that that person has an access right into the military base. We could see American service personnel training Cameroonian soldiers in night vision equipment. And we can see a film that could almost be comical if it would not be so sad of American uh, um, military personnel in Cameroonian one playing football with night goggles equipment, bumping into the building where detainees are held and questioned and tortured according to, again, amnesty here. So these are the places where uh, American service personnel were seen. These are the areas where we know from the photograph where they were. These are the detention cells uh, where people died in custody also, and this is where they are tortured. Uh, and I think that these kind of superimposition uh, make, it, uh, make our cases strong uh, and amplify those testimonies of detainees and allow us um, to actually present solid cases that open in that case uh, a full American uh, AFRICOM investigation. Thank you for listening.